all stand together.
Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good. the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song you are good good oh, you are good good oh you are good
amazing love I know it's true It's my joy to honor you In all I do I honor you You are my king You It's my joy to honor you in all I do. Child. 
child of God Let's stand for this last song the day in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away Rescue us now, Lord, we pray. Father, thank you once again just for allowing us to have voices to praise you. You have, among all of creation, you've granted us the ability to use our voices to sing praises, to worship you. We're thankful for that, Lord, and pray that this has been pleasing in your sight and in your ears. And Father, as we open your word together and as your word is opened around campus, shared in each of the different age groups that gather here every Sunday and every Wednesday, Lord, we pray that, that you would be changing our hearts and minds, that you would be helping us to hear your voice 
to hear your truth, to hear your realities, and to trust you, Lord. Father, help us. We desire to know you, to believe you, to trust you, and we need to do all three of these things better. We need to know more about you. We need to, to believe you more, and we need to trust you more. Help us to do these things, Lord. And we're grateful that you've granted us your son Jesus and the Holy Spirit to help us do exactly that. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. You may all be seated. For those of you who were here last week, no pastors were injured in deciding who would teach tonight. For those of you who weren't here, Garrett was really excited and talked about coming back and said we would arm wrestle for it. We didn't arm wrestle. Just This was our schedule, so... Um, if you didn't, did everybody pick up one of these uh, charts of the kings on your way in? They were right next to the lyrics. If you didn't, maybe raise your hand and Ron could bring some around. It's not critical that you have it, but it is a good resource, a good reference. We're not going to look at it a ton, but we will look at it a little bit this evening and may reference it at other times. One of the reasons to have this is because in this section through kings, when we get into the... the uh, just the changing of the guard in both the north and the south. Uh, there's a lot of very similar names. It's easy to get confused, and it's really challenging to put this timeline together. So I spent hours deciphering through Scripture and laying out this timeline. You're not believing that, are you? Actually, I didn't do this. Somebody way smarter did, <laughs> and way better. But um, it is very handy to have. And it also shows the overlap between the two kingdoms, which, so basically, this is a chart of what we're going to be reading, or it's a chronologically laid out map of what we're going to be reading. On the back side, it goes through essentially the same thing. There may be, uh, well, never mind, I even said that. It, it also lays in here which um, books of the prophets, the minor prophets and the major prophets, line up with, with which kingdoms when that particular prophet was serving. So it was just kind of a handy tool. You might, I would throw it in your Bible and hang on to it, especially as we go through First and Second Kings. Um, we may reference it from time to time. It's also really handy to look at and see as, as a, well, not really part of the discussion, but one of the things that comes up tonight is that if you look down the right-hand column of the front page again, um, the coolest looking side, the one that says the kings of Judah and Israel, um, you look on the right-hand side, and it's thumbs down on every king. Essentially, every one of them followed in the ways of Jeroboam, which we'll talk about tonight. They, they were idolatrous. And so the northern kingdom, which is referred to as Israel, had not even one good king. Now, on the other side, the left-hand side of the chart, you'll notice that there are some bad kings, there's some good kings, and then there's some mediocre kings. And the different shaded boxes there kind of relate to if, it, if they're uh, a king similar to Saul. It means they just weren't a very good king. They weren't following after God. They weren't um, following the Deuteronomic covenant. They weren't honoring God in how they were leading Israel or how they were leading the nation, or whether it was Israel or Judah. Uh, this would be Judah, sorry, to not confuse you. The southern kingdom is referred to as Judah. Uh, and then you've got some other kings that it gives them kind of a sideways thumb, which means they were okay. They were like Solomon. Maybe they started off good. Maybe they ended good. Um, but there were good things about their reign as a king. And then, of course, there are those who were com comparable. They, they were like their father, David, and they followed that. They sought after God's heart. And they're, they're um, good kings. So they're the, the, uh, the unshaded box. And the slightly shaded box, which goes along with the sideways thumbs, or the kind of the neutral, more moderate, not, not great, but not terrible. And then, of course, the thumbs down, the dark box. Um, so a, a handy thing to have, and uh, probably won't refer to it again this evening. Other, well, I should, a little bit more on that. So we're right at the top of this. We're just about um, 922 BC. The kingdom's just divided, as you know. Um, King Solomon, because of his idolatrousness, because of the multiple wives that he had, and them actually pulling him um, near a thousand, well, 700 wives and 300 concubines. I mean, it's hard enough to get along with one person. How, uh, anyway, 
Um, so I, can't, I just can't imagine. A lot of those were political, for political reasons, and not sanctioned by God. He told them in Deuteronomy that the king should not have multiple wives. Not that he shouldn't have more than one necessarily, because God uh, ideally is one man, one woman, right? One wife. But God didn't condemn any of the um, polygamy that went on in the Old Testament. It just wasn't the ideal, uh, as long as they were faithful and, and, uh, and stayed true in that relationship. But he certainly told them not to have many wives, which Solomon had way more than many. So did David. I mean, it really was a downfall of both of these guys. Um, one of the downfalls. And uh, so we're right there at 922, right at the beginning of the, division, the divided kingdom. And we're going to talk about both of these kings, Rehoboam in the south of, over Judah and uh, Jeroboam, the first Jeroboam in the north, the king of, over Israel. Um, so that's where we're at on the timeline. A couple of other just kind of big picture items. This is a little bit different maybe than what we've talked about before, different than I've talked about before anyway. A uh, different way of looking at this, uh, this little chunk of historical documents that we've been going through. Uh, kind of as a big picture item, you might consider this at least, thinking of Joshua, the book of Joshua. As the because this is when the Israelites went in and took over the land and they drove out the Canaanites, right? Or most of them. That's what they were supposed to do, is drive them all out. Uh, so, so Joshua, as a kind of an overarching theme, you could think of as the land of Canaan becoming Israelite. Okay? The Israelites taking over the land for the most part. And then after we move out of Joshua, we move into the book of Judges. And this is kind of a reversal of that process that happened. God was with Joshua, with the people, went in, and, they, and they, they didn't take over all of the land like they were supposed to, but a vast majority of it, they settled, they were following after God. It was, it was a good generation, a good couple of generations there, really, with Joshua. And then once Joshua passed, there was no real leader in uh, Israel. And that's when we get into the book of Judges. And this is kind of a reversal of that whole process. People did, if you remember from Judges, they did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's how it ends. And the process was just a slow decline from Joshua down through until that last depressing verse that says everybody did what was right in their own eyes. There was no king in Israel, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. So it was the land really kind of turning back into Canaan, under Canaanite influence again, um, because the, the way people... There just wasn't uh, worship of Yahweh like there had been with Joshua. And then God intervenes in uh, uh, the books of First and Second Samuel. The monarchy begins, and we see as God intervenes again and is helping his people once again, there's, there's, uh, especially by the time we get to King David, there's this just the pinnacle of Israelite life and a pinnacle of the expansion of the territory and a pinnacle in um, how much they're worshiping and honoring God. And they've got a king who's chosen by God and he's a man after God's own heart. And even as we discussed that, you know, God gives him this heart. God allow, gives him the ability to uh, desire him and to want to follow after him. But it's um, really the height of the kingdom in Israel. And then as Solomon uh, becomes king, he actually expands the territory a little bit more. He gathers a lot of wealth. Uh, it really becomes a national, uh, on the national scene, Israel is somebody. They're, they're on the map. And, and Solomon does quite well for a period of time. And then because of the multiple wives and the influence, and it's not just because he had multiple wives. I'm not blaming women, okay? So don't take it that way at all. It's not at all what I'm saying. But they were, many of them were from foreign territories, they had other gods, and they influenced Solomon to the point that he actually set up temples and high places for them to go and worship, and more than likely participated himself and ended poorly. And God said, because of your disobedience, if you remember chapter 11 of 1 Kings, where we're at now in chapter 11, um, God had said, I'm, uh, through one of the prophets, he actually told Jeroboam that uh, I'm going to rip, you remember he took, he took uh, part of his garment and ripped it and, and told him to rip it into 10 pieces or 12 pieces. And he said, I'm going to rip away from Solomon or from the, from the dynasty of David 10 tribes. And I'm going to give them to you, Jeroboam, if you'll obey me. He really was making the same kind of covenant 
with Jeroboam that he'd made with David, except that it was very conditional. David's covenant was eternal. The Davidic covenant, the covenant that God made with David, was eternal. Um, it didn't depend upon anyone's uh, cooperation, although they experienced discipline because of um, not being obedient. With Jeroboam, it was very conditional. It's like, if you follow after me like, like David did, then I will give you a dynasty in the north, and you'll be king of the north, and, and uh, good things will happen for, that, uh, for the nations or for the ten tribes up there. So really, this great opportunity laid out in front of Jeroboam. Um, if he'll follow after God, it could be a thriving nation in the north, even though it would be separate. And as we enter into the story tonight, um, or when we enter into the story, there's, I'm going to tell you a little other short story before we get there, but when we enter into the story tonight, what we're going to see is these two kings, um, and if you remember last week where Garrett finished off, Rehoboam, the king of Judah, had gathered up an army, and a man of God said, don't do this. Don't attack your brothers. You're still brothers in God. They are your tribesmen, so don't do this thing. And Rehoboam listened. He, re he relented, and they didn't attack their brothers. So he trusted God at that point. Now, he had his own issues and problems with idolatry, and, and we're going to see that in the text tonight. Um, but he actually finished well. And one of the texts that we'll look at that's in another, not in First Kings, um, but tells us that, that uh, Rehoboam actually probably was, even though he had this period of time where he was not trusting God, he probably finished really well, repented. And um, even though there was discipline that happened, uh, he was trusting God at that point. And we'll, we'll get there. Before we get there, though, I just want to tell you a story. I've told, some of you have heard this before. It's about a personal experience that I had. Um, not to drag too many details into it, but uh, I came to the Lord late in life, in my 30s. Um, I'm 50-something now. And um, so it's been 20-ish, 20-some years. And when that first happened, when I first really committed and started walking with the Lord, there was a group of... of um, guys here, some of the pastors and a couple other guys that I'd gotten connected with, because I came in and into the office on a regular basis and uh, met with Pastor Don Holmes, who's now with the Lord. And he just, he mentored me for probably two years solid. He mentored, during that same time frame, he also was mentoring my wife, Kelly, who's also named Kelly. Um, and uh, just because of things that had happened in both of our lives and the place we were and uh, Anyway, it went from him mentoring both of us to him mentoring us together because we were thought we were headed towards marriage, which obviously happened at this point. Um, but through that process and along the way, uh, this group of guys, uh, was, it was Pastor Doug, save the pieces, um, Pastor Doug, Pastor Chris, um, Pastor Daryl Wiltrout, he's not officially on staff as a pastor, but... Um, myself and Pastor Don, and we, we, they, they did this multiple times. They went out on little excursions. They'd go camping, and they would fast for a week. And um, I had never done anything anywhere close to that, so I took Gatorade because I wasn't sure I could survive a week without some kind of sugar or sucrose. Um, anyway, we were over by the lava beds. You guys all know where the lava beds are over in Klamath Falls? So we weren't over by Captain Jack's, but around the corner of the camp. There's a campground right there by the caves. And there's trails that go out through the lava beds. And it's summer, so it's hot. Um, you know, but we've, we've got our water and, and things, and I've got Gatorade. And, and uh, one of the afternoons, I decided to go out on a walk, uh, just to walk one of these trails. I think it was probably about a five-mile loop. And there's maps at the beginnings of these trails. So I grabbed a map, and I head out, and I get partway out across this, and I'm looking at the map, and, and I, I kind of like shortcuts. I don't know about you guys, but I like shortcuts. So I'm looking at the map, and it's like, you know, I bet if I went right across this direction, I'd run right back into the trail over there, not very far, and, you know, I'd cut off a little bit of time, not too big of a deal. And I'm, I'm thinking that I want to do this, like, ah, nah, I better not. I better just stay on the trail. So I do. I stay on the trail, and I get maybe a third of the way around or halfway around to the point where, where I think I would have reconnected with the trail. And I'm looking, it's just kind of a high, high place on the trail there. And I'm looking back, and I can see these big, <laughs> like, valleys of lava or um, 
basalt rock, right? Not lava. There's no lava over there right now. But the remnants, the cooled lava, so the basalt, you know, and there's just these big canyons of it. It's like that would not have been fun to have been walking through those. I'm sure glad that I stayed on the trail. I go around a little bit further, and again, and I'm, so by this, you know, I'm maybe halfway around total. I'm starting to get a little thirsty. I still have some water with me, but, and I'm hot, and I'm tired because I haven't eaten anything. It was two or three days in to our, uh, our week, as I recall. And, um, and I hit another point, and I'm looking at the map again, and it's like, Oh, this looks like a good spot to cut across to take a little shortcut. You know, same kind of thing. Cut across over in here and uh, maybe save a little bit of time, get back to camp quicker so I can take a nap and drink. I mean, that's get some water. You know, that's what we were doing. Taking naps, drinking water or Gatorade and uh, reading the word and praying. So um, it's not like I was missing anything back at camp. By There was no need to take a shortcut. Anyway, um, but I'm thinking this looks like another good spot where I could cut across. Thankfully, I didn't, because again, same kind of situation. I get around to where I think I probably would have run back into the trail, and I was having a hard time staying on the trail by myself, I mean, with a map, and I'm on the trail. You know, when you're on a trail, it's a little bit easier to follow, but if you cut across a trail that's not, like, really well-defined, I don't know if you've ever done this. I've done it out hunting before. You can walk right across a trail, not realize it, and, you know, be turned around and mixed up and half lost, and if panic sets in, then you really are lost, and bad things happen. Um, If you find yourself in that situation, side note, if you find yourself in that situation, don't panic. Backtrack, usually, but anyway. So I hit this point where I figure I would have run back into the trail, and it's like there is, and I'm thinking to myself, there is no way I would have seen this as the trail. Because I was on it, I could tell the path that I needed to stay on. So a second time, on this little journey that I, that uh, it was, you know, I'm just thinking to myself, it's a good thing I didn't take a shortcut. And I walk on around and I get around to the beginning of the trail again and I sit down and I'm just thinking and praying and drinking the last bit of, of uh, water or Gatorade, whatever I had with me on the walk. And, um, and I didn't have an audible voice, okay, but the Lord <laughs> was speaking to me in those moments. And, sorry. What, what he was saying is, essentially, I've got you. Don't take shortcuts. <laughs> I know the path that I have you on. Because at this point in, in life and in decisions, there were just a lot of unknowns out before me. Um, unknown about this potential. I don't remember if Kelly and I were married by then or not. But unknown job future. Unknown... Um, Marital status, potentially, I don't remember exactly the, where this fits in the time frame, but just things that were unknown in my life and things that I was sure that the Lord was calling me toward to do, but I, I wanted to know what those were, and I was potentially ready to take shortcuts to get there, shortcuts to get to the place that I knew God was taking me. And in this process, just thinking back through the two incidences out on the trail, God was clearly telling me... Um, as far as I'm concerned, God was clearly telling me that I know the path that I have you on. I know your route. Stay on it and trust me. Stay on it and trust me. Now, this is going to fit into our message tonight. And, um, because we've got two guys, two kings here that have been put into positions very, in a similar manner where um, God has put them in spots that are unknown to them. There are unknowns laid out before them in what the kingdom looks like in the moment and what the future of the kingdom looks like, the kingdom of Israel and, and Judah. Um, and it's, there's this split that's happened. So, and unknowns in how, you know, how am I going to stay in power? I mean, we've got one guy who's, who grew up in Solomon's home. So he would have understood at least a little bit about what it meant to be a king, what it meant to lead people. Um, On the other hand, Jeroboam was not from a royal line. He was just this guy who happened to be a good leader and and good at part of the, uh, some of the projects that were going on. If you remember, because he had found favor um, and 
I'm not remembering super clear from chapter 11, but I think after God had told him he was going to rip the kingdom away and give it to him, Solomon actually maybe had heard about this and was upset and tried to kill him, and he fled to Egypt, Jeroboam did. So he spent some time in Egypt, and uh, last week he came back, and that's when we had the division of the two kingdoms. And we have uh, Rehoboam, the king of Judah, Solomon's son, who... uh, was crowned king in Shechem, actually. And if you recall, the people, of, especially the people in the north, were saying, hey, your dad put too heavy, Solomon put too heavy of a burden on us. Lighten our load. And he took counsel with the old men and the young men and made a terrible decision and said, no, we're not going to lighten the load. We're going to increase it because I'm tougher than my dad. Uh, so a really poor decision. They, and they killed the taskmaster that he sent to put them back to work. And then he fled south to his own camp to Judah. And at the same time, we've got Jeroboam who's there, and how much he was involved in all of this, who knows, but probably had some influence and um, uh, potentially even riled the people up against what was happening. Um, and so they decided to make him king, and he became king in uh, Jerusalem, or in, uh, also in Shechem, but king of Israel in the north. So that pretty much brings us up to date into chapter 12, and we're going to be starting in verse 25. And we're going to attempt to get all the way through the end of 14. We shall see. I'm going to read a little bit bigger chunks here, I think, than than, uh, probably what I typically do, um, and make some comments along the way. But chapter 12 of 1 Kings and verse 25. Uh, This is Jeroboam's big sin, and it becomes known as the Jeroboam cult, and uh, it's uh, essentially every one of the kings gets in the north, in Israel, gets accused of following after Jeroboam and, uh, you know, committing the same sin he did through idolatry. So, verse 25, then Jeroboam built a Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there, and he went out from there and built Peniel. Uh, Just quick on these two places. These are two very important places. Shechem was right in between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, which is the uh, the the two mountains of blessing and cursing of blessing and curse in Joshua when they entered into the land and Joshua took them there, reminded them of the Deuteronomic covenant and the law and everything that God called them to do. And you're going to serve Yahweh, and if you do it, you're going to be blessed. And if you don't, you're going to you're going to experience discipline or curse. And you've got people on both these mountains, and they're hollering back and forth. You guys remember this story from Joshua? You should read Joshua again if you don't. It's a cool story. Um, anyway, so this is, this is right near there, or it is right there. Uh, it's also um, the east-west highway, essentially, through the northern part of Israel. Shechem is right in the middle of it. So it's a very key strategic military place um, that Jeroboam builds up, and he uh, puts his home there. It, it's also where... Um, Jacob, make sure I get my stories right here. It's where Jacob wrestles with God and sees the ladder, uh, Jacob's ladder, the ladder to heaven. So um, historically sacred place. And Peniel is where Jacob um, laid his head on the rock and had, uh, oh, actually, Peniel is where he saw Jacob's ladder because he was dreaming when he saw that. Shechem is where, uh, where Jacob wrestled with with. Uh, pre-incarnate Christ, most likely. Um, so two very sacred places in historically important places. And uh, Peniel is actually Transjordan, so it's on the other side of the Jordan. And um, so just to kind of give you an idea where these two are and the importance of, of the two cities. Verse 26, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David if this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Now, think this through for a second. God has told him he's going to give him the ten tribes. Um, Now, God also orchestrated all of this to happen so that this split, this rift remained, okay? But it's like God said he's going to do this. Rehoboam or Jeroboam, why why don't you just trust him that he's going to work it out? Keep serving him. Don't be worried about the people 
They're going to be continuing to worship Yahweh. That's what they're supposed to do. That's what, that's what you should be doing in the north, too. That's what you should be leading the people in Israel to do as well. Um, but instead, he's worried about staying in power. Uh, he's worried about the, that the people are going to kill him and that they will turn, their hearts will turn back to not only to Yahweh, but also to David's line and to uh, Rehoboam, the king of Judah. Verse 28, so the king took counsel with who we don't know, but obviously nobody you want to take counsel from, from the outcome here. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, you have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. This should remind all of us of Exodus and the golden calf. And when Aaron said, behold your God who brought you up out of Egypt, it's, it's, there's, it's just super parallel here, even though he builds two in this story. But, um, and if you recall how many times God reminded them, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Uh, verse 29, and he set one in Bethel, so this would be in the south, southern part of northern Israel, or the northern tribes, and he set, uh, the other he put in Dan, which would have been in the far north. Then this thing became a sin, for the people went as far as Dan to be before one. He also made temples on high places and appointed priests from among all the people who were not of the Levites. And Jeroboam appointed a feast on the 15th day of the eighth month, just like the feast that was in Judah, which the feast in Judah would have been the Day of Atonement. It happened on the 15th day of the seventh month. And he offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places that he had made. He went up to the altar that he had made in Bethel on the 15th day in the eighth month, in the month that he had devised from his own heart, from his own heart. He sought counsel, but he didn't seek counsel from God. He sought counsel from bad counselors and then also listened to his own heart. Uh, and he instituted a feast for the people of Israel and went up to the altar to make offerings. Now, there are a few reasons why. Um, so in Israel, the harvest would have happened just about a month later in the north than it did in the south. So as far as just kind of laying out some legitimate reasons for, for uh, why he picked this day, not that it's right, okay, I'm not saying that at all, um, but just in his own mind, log thinking logically, it's like uh, this, this is also a distinction for us. Our harvest happens later in the year, so our festival should be later in the year. And he, tells, he essentially tells the people, there's no reason for you to go all the way to Jerusalem anymore. We'll just set up our own worship here. Now, to us, this looks like, and even the comparison with, um, with Aaron and the golden calf in Exodus, it appears that this is just blatant idolatry. Jeroboam would disagree with us because he would have said, no, I've appointed priests of Yahweh. Although he's appointed his own kinds of priests from whoever, not just Levites, like God said to do. Um, so he's making all these decisions on his own, it's very, but it looks very much like Jewish worship, worship or worship of Yahweh, uh, just with these slight changes. But God's not really that concerned, is he, with the details? This should still work, and people don't have to go as far, makes us separate. Uh, he also would have said that we're not actually worshiping these golden idols or the calves, but they represent like the footstool of God. There's an invisible God um, that, whose foot is on the calf and presumably a foot on each calf and standing guard all, over all of, uh, um, of Israel, the northern tribes. Now, the problem with this is, is, is that the golden calves would have been so familiar to, to the people because this was Canaanite worship. This is worship of Baal. It's, it's uh, so close, even though he's using the right terminology, he's using priesthood and Yahweh and terms that would have been very familiar to everyone in, in uh, Judah, um, but it's different. It's just not the same. And it's outside of God's covenant, outside of God's will. And nobody told him to do this. He decided to do this uh, because of his own heart, devised it in his own heart. Verse 13, now in this section, he gets confronted by a man of God. Um, and behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord, by the word of Yahweh, to Bethel. 
Jeroboam was standing by the, by the altar to make offerings. So picture this. He's got his brand new place, his brand new altar all set up, and he's got his people all gathered there, and he's, they're about to make offerings. And this guy shows up from Judah, who none of them know, an unnamed man. And the man cries out against the altar, verse 2. Uh, he cries out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says Yahweh, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David. Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. Now, God never sanctioned human sacrifice, okay? But he is declaring here that a king of David, really following after God, not that God ever wants human sacrifice, um, but he is saying that, that upon this altar, this whole... Um, idolatrous, syncretistic form of worship and all the priests who are leading it are going to end up dying on the altar and burn there and their bones are going to be there. Uh, not as an offering to God because God never wants human sacrifice. Um, but he is saying there's going to be judgment that's going to come upon you. And upon this very altar is where some of that's going to happen. Interestingly, many of you probably recognize the name Josiah. This actually happens about 300 years later. This is one of two places... Not, there are multiple prophecies that happen down the, down the line considerably, right? But, um, but this is one of two places where uh, a man is named, his title is given, and the things he's going to do that's very clear, and then 300 years later it happens. The other one is when um, uh, Isaiah, I think, Daniel is the one who recognizes it. It's either Isaiah or Jeremiah, says that um, Cyrus is going is to send my people back. This is also one that happens like two, three, four hundred years before it actually happens, where you actually have the name and exactly the events that are going to happen. Um, so it's a bit unique in Scripture, which makes it quite amazing that we don't know who the guy is, don't have a name to go with it. Um, but he is a man of God. So the end of verse 2, and human bones shall be burned on you. Verse 3. And he gave a sign the same day, which often accompanied, was one of the signs that uh, a miracle, along with um, the words of a prophet, granted uh, credence to it, that it was actually a word from the Lord. So when he gave a sign the same day, saying, this is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar, this altar that Jeroboam has just built, shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it uh, shall be poured out. And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar and said, seize him. Being the king, he's got to do something, right? And as he did this, as he stretched out his hand uh, against him, it dried up so that he couldn't draw it back to himself. Now, we've seen enough movies and various things that you can, you can imagine what his arm must have, some kind of deformity, and he couldn't draw it back. I mean, he's, he's instantly crippled. And the altar. Um, in, in the ESV here, it says that it's torn down. In other translations, it says that it's going to split open. Um, so either way, the altar was torn down and the ashes poured out from the altar. Verse 5. According to the sign that the, that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king said to the man of God, Entreat now the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me. And the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him and became as it was before. An amazing scene here. Um, I mean, especially for Jeroboam, you would think this guy would be falling on his knees and, and uh, worshiping whoever it is that just caused my arm to be shriveled and now has, has healed it, um, but he doesn't. Interesting, too, that he says, the Lord your God, Yahweh your God, Yahweh Elohim, um, so he knew who it was, which makes sense because he'd heard before from a man of God telling him he was going to actually be in this position as the leader over the northern ten tribes anyway. So the man entreated him. His hand was restored. Verse 7, and the king said to the man of God, come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. Uh, potentially trying to bribe him. Let's come and Become, come into my service so that I can utilize these powers you have as a prophet of God. And the man said, uh, and the man of God said to the king, if you give me half your house, I will not go in with you. And I will not eat bread or drink water in this place. Very rude response here, um, but there's good reason for it. 
Verse 9, For so it was commanded me by the word of Yahweh, saying, You shall neither, neither eat bread nor drink water, nor return by the way that you came. So he went another way, and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. Um, verse 11. This next section is maybe one of the strangest parts of Scripture, actually, the way the story comes together and unfolds. But Now, an old prophet lived in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also, also told to their father the words that he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, which way did he go? And his sons showed him the way that the man of God, who came from Judah, had gone. And he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he mounted it. And he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with you or go in with you, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by the way that you came. Verse 18, and he said to him, well, I also am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you into your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So he went back with him, and he ate bread in his house and drank water. So both of these people are men of God, okay? Why this guy lied to him, I have no idea. Maybe he was intrigued. Maybe it's been a while since he's had a word from the Lord. Um, I mean, this is all just conjecture. I have no idea why, um, why he lies to him. But take note the lie that he tells. He says, an angel told me. Um, in Galatians... It says, even if an angel comes, or even, Paul says, even if I come back from the dead and tell you a different gospel than what you've heard, than what we've shared already, may they be accursed, may anathema, may they be damned to hell, essentially. Uh, so the point here being that if you've had a word from the Lord and you know that it's from God, don't let other people change your mind, no matter what the story is that they bring. Now, have a little bit of humbleness in that as well, because one of, I'll, I'll tell you, one of the challenges in, in trying to help people walk with the Lord or help people make decisions is when they come to you and you're having a discussion and they say, yeah, well, God told me such and such. This tends to end the conversation because it's like, if, well, if God told you, why are you asking me? If you really heard from the Lord, why are you asking me? Why are you asking me for pastoral counsel? Um, so be careful in using that. Uh, you want to have confirmation here, number one. You want to have confirmation here, of course, although our hearts are deceitful, but the Spirit does live within us, so there is confirmation that happens there. And you want to have confirmation from other people in your life, people that you respect, mentors, pastors, counselors, really good friends, people that are willing and able to speak into your life and tell you, ah, I think maybe that's bad pizza. Or I think maybe this is just what you really want because of whatever. Um, so just a cautionary note in that. But this guy makes a, the young guy here, for whatever reason, why he didn't trust the word that he had from God. It gets repeated at least three times that, that God told me not to come back, not to eat or drink in this place, in this land, but to, and to take a different way home. As soon as the guy says, oh, but an angel told me. It seems to, for some reason, he lets that trump what he already knew was right and true. Um, and just, I mean, consider that he's just seen the altar split in half and the ashes pour out and he's seen the king's hand get shriveled and then he's seen the king's hand get healed and still <laughs> he, he lets, he, he at the very least gets deceived if not something else. Um, he does get disciplined for this as well. Well, disciplined. He actually pays with his life. So, um, so God is concerned with the details, and God is concerned with the things that he tells us. Um, verse 20, and they sat at the table. The word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. So this is the old prophet, right? This is the same one who had just lied to him, and now the word of the Lord does come to him. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah. Thus says the Lord, 
Because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the command that the Lord your God commanded you, but have come back and have eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said to you, eat no bread and drink no water, your body shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. And after he'd eaten bread and drunk, he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back. And ha- <laughs> this is great. I mean, I just lied to you in order to get you back to my house. And now the word of the Lord has come to me and I'm telling you, you're going to die. And now go get on that donkey and leave. Um, And as he went away, a lion met him on the road and killed him, and his body was thrown in the road. And the donkey stood beside it, the lion also stood beside the body. And behold, men passed by and saw the body thrown in the road, and the lion standing by the body. That had to be quite a sight. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet lived. little side note here, donkeys and lions do exactly what God tells them to do, Um, even though they may have... uh, hunger pains going on for the lion, or, you know, he's got a fresh meal here, two, two for the price of one, and yet um, uh, he doesn't, the lion does not destroy or eat either of these people or the man or the donkey. Um, verse 26, and when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard of it, he said, it is the man of God who disobeyed the word of the Lord. He knew exactly who it was immediately. Therefore, the Lord has given him to the lion which has torn him and killed him, according to the word that the Lord spoke to him. And he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. And they saddled it. And they went and found his body uh, thrown in the road, and the donkey and the lion still there standing beside the body. The lion had not eaten the body or torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the body of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid the body in his own grave. And they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. And after he had buried him, he said to his sons, When I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying that he called out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places that are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. He's bearing witness. We've got this this other prophet who's bearing witness about everything this man said was true, even in his death. He is um, he's an example of God keeping his word because he told the man if, to do this, you know, to, to not go back and eat bread and, or you know, not to go back and dine with him, not to go back and sup with him. Um, so even in his death, he's declaring God's goodness and God's truth. And the old prophet here realizes this, and, and they honor him. I mean, it's a very honorable burial that they give him, and they mourn for him. And uh, this idea of him going back and being buried with him is also just uh, very honoring about um, who this man was. <clears throat> and after this, verse 33, after this thing, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but made priests for the high places again from among all the people. Any who would, he ordained to be priests of the high places. And this thing became sin to the house of Jeroboam, so as to cut it off and to, and to destroy it from the face of the earth. You would think that after seeing all this, Jeroboam would have come to his senses and realized who God was. He certainly would have heard about everything that happened to this man as well, that once he disobeyed God and went back and then died, um, surely all of this information, this story got back to Jeroboam. But he didn't change. Quick side note, two generations that have seen the most miracles, the most miraculous signs from God, um, Moses' generation, the generation in Exodus, and those alive during Jesus' time, both of those generations saw more miracles than any other generations put together, probably, and yet had the least faith, trusted God the least. Um, uh, Moses' generation, with the exception of, of uh, Joshua and Caleb, they all died out in the desert because of their lack of trust. And Jesus' generation, you know, at least in the immediate time frame, um, 12 apostles and how many ever disciples around them, maybe a few hundred, trusted him and believed in him. Yet he, he perf- not performed, that's a, that's a terrible word, uh, he showed who he was through signs and miracles, signs and wonders uh, to, to probably tens of thousands of people. 
would have been aware of and seen these. And yet that did not create faith. So when we think, why doesn't God, why wouldn't God, why doesn't God heal this person or heal that person? Um, oftentimes it's because his greatest concern is people trusting in him and believing in him. And signs and miracles don't always make that happen. Verse 14, at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, now this is the king of Israel, right? The north, northern tribes. His son, Abijah, becomes sick. Another uh, Abijah, Rehoboam in the south also has a son named Abijah. In fact, he becomes his successor in the south. The name Abijah means my father is Yahweh. So both these guys maybe were a little arrogant, naming their sons Abijah. Um, anyway, his son, Jer- the son of Jeroboam falls sick, and Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise and disguise yourself, that it not be known that you are the wife of Jeroboam, and go to Shiloh. Behold, Ahijah, the prophet is there, who said of me that I should be king over this people. So this is the same prophet he heard from in chapter, back in chapter 11. And take with you ten loaves, some cakes, and a jar of honey, and go to him. He will tell you what shall happen to the child." So Jeroboam's wife did so. She arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. Now Ahijah could not see her, for his eyes were dim because of his age. Consider the scene here. Jeroboam is sending his wife to go see a a prophet of God, wanting to know what's going to happen in the future, and yet he wants her to go disguised, as as if a man of God who can see into the future isn't going to understand or realize who she is, right? I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, what it really does is it shows you a picture of the kind of faith that Jeroboam has. He actually, which this was pretty widespread, in, especially in Canaan, um, and so as the syncretism happened, a lot of uh, Jewish people would have thought the same thing. But um, throughout most of, uh, much of the world, actually, this was kind of the case. They thought, well, Yahweh is the God of Israel. He's the God of this territory, and Baal is the God of this territory. So when Jeroboam's up in the north, he's thinking, well, God's down there. He's not going to hear what I'm saying to my wife about this, but, but, you know, surely Ahijah can hear from God because he's in the same place. So it's just this mentality of how they viewed God. Um, Even still, it just, it makes, it it seems unfathomable to me, at least, and to us, I think, that, that you would send somebody to a man of God expecting him to tell you, to forth tell things that are going to be happening and think that you can hide from him or uh, disguise yourself. So anyway, verse 5. And the Lord said to Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam is coming to inquire of you concerning her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus you shall say to her. We find out later what uh, that is. So when she came, she pretended to be another woman. But when Ahijah heard the feet, the sound of her feet as she came to the door, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another? For I am charged with unbearable news for you. Go tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. And yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart, doing only that uh, which was right in his eyes. You've done evil above all who were before you and have gone and made for yourself other gods and metal images, provoking me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I will bring harm upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam every male, both bond and free in Israel, and will burn up the house of Jeroboam as a man burns up dung until it is all gone. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, uh, the dogs shall eat. And anyone who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens shall eat. For the Lord has spoken it. Arise, therefore, go to your house. When your feet enter the city, the child shall die. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him. For he only, this is interesting here, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found something pleasing to the Lord, the God of Israel, and the house of Jeroboam. We oftentimes think that judgment must be upon somebody who dies young, or upon a family maybe because... uh, a child dies young. In this instance, God is saying, no, actually, I'm taking this son because I see something good in him. Uh, So he's not going to 
have the same fate that the rest of your household is going to have. This idea of that none of them are going to be, um, uh, what did it say, none of them will be buried, um, or none of them shall come to the grave. Uh, the idea here is, is, is that because there's going to be so much strife, you're not going to be able to take care of them properly. You're not going to be able to give them an honorable burial. Um, so the contrast between things as they are in this moment and what they might, must be like for that to happen is uh, drastic. And, and uh, just things are going to change drastically if this is going to be the case, that his household, his descendants are going to um, die in the fields, essentially, and be eaten by animals. Uh, or the birds of the air. Um, verse 14, Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam today. And henceforth, the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and root up Israel out of this good land that he gave to their fathers, and scatter them beyond the Euphrates, because they have made their ashram, provoking the Lord to anger. And he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned and made Israel to sin. Then Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Tirzah. And as she came to the threshold of the house, the child died. And all Israel buried him and mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Ahijah the prophet. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. We have that book. That's First and Second Chronicles. Um, and the time that Jeroboam reigned was 22 years, and he slept with his fathers, and Nadab, his son, reigned in his place. At this point, we're going to shift to the south, and it's going to be uh, verse 21. We're going, to, we're going to read more about Rehoboam and his reign in Judah. Now Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city that the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Nema the Ammonite. And Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So Nema the Ammonite, so she was one of Solomon's many wives that wasn't, part, she wasn't uh, Jewish. And they provoked him to jealousy with their sins that they committed, more than all that their fathers had done. For they also built for themselves high places and pillars, an ashram, which were poles, part of uh, um, Baal and uh, just part of the worship cult that was going on among the Canaanites in particular. Um, so pillars and ashram on every high hill and an, under every green tree. And there were also male cult prostitutes in the land. Quite likely, he's talking about exactly what you think here, homosexuality happening in Judah, in the, in the high places. The worship that was happening here was basically sex orgies um, for fertility, trying to appease the fertility gods and uh, to have good crops every year. And it just, this was Canaanite worship. So not only has it, has it come to pass in the north, it's also come to pass in the south. It's really the fruit of Solomon that we're seeing here, and both of, both of these kings followed in his footsteps. Um, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations that the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. He took away the treasures of the house of the Lord, so everything that Solomon had built, all the gold um, and, and the treasures of the king's house, he took away everything. He also took away all the shields of gold that Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam made in their place shields of bronze and committed them to the hands of the officers of the guard who kept door of the king's house. And as often as the king went into the house of the Lord, the guard carried them and brought them back to the guard room. So even, even these bronze shields would have been very impressive. But um, just think of the, if nothing else, just the wealth difference between all these shields of gold uh, compared to shields of, of bronze. So Shishak, you also can read um, about him. I'm just going to tell you this part because of uh, our time frame. But Second Chronicles chapter 12, you can see where Shishak came up. And, and uh, the Egyptian record says that they sacked about 150 cities, including Jerusalem. And essentially, this, this gold and all the treasures that, that it says that Shishak took from the, um, from the temple and from uh, the house of the king... 
This basically was them paying tribute to him. It's like, hey, we're going to let you have all these things. Just leave. Because if, if we fight, you're surely going to win. Or you're going you're gonna to lose some people. And we're going to lose some people. Um, so rather than doing that, why don't, just take the gold and leave us, leave us be. So Shishak agrees and takes all their best treasures. Perhaps some would even speculate that the Ark of the Covenant went to Egypt at this point. And that great theologian, Indiana Jones, in the movie... Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, the, the guy, they actually mentioned there that Shishak took the uh, Ark, and this is why it's in Egypt when, uh, when Indiana and the Germans find it. Um, that's always the picture I get when you think of Jer- Jeroboam's arm shriveling, is when they open the Ark, if you've seen the movie, and, and the guys just all shrivel up, and it's like, whoa. Anyway... Um, So it is possible, speculation, nobody really knows, uh, but it is possible that the Ark of the Covenant got taken at that point. Um, Verse 29, now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all he did, are they not written in the books of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Again, this is 1 and 2 Chronicles, we have these books. There are other books mentioned throughout the Bible as references that the writers of uh, Kings and Chronicles both probably used, as well as other authors they would have used as uh, historical reference um, that we don't have. But uh, it is referring to the Chronicles that you're familiar with here. Verse 30, And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Again, it mentions his mom, which is interesting. His mother's name was Nema, the Ammonite. I think just pressing home the point here that he's the, he's the, his mom is not... Um, uh, not an Israelite. She's an Ammonite. And Abijam, his son, reigned in his place. So, how do, we, how do we apply this to our lives? What does this mean to us? I mean, this story from so many, so many years ago. Well, I mentioned trust early on and, and being on the path. You know, this is speculation, okay? So take it for what it's worth. But it's possible. Is it not possible that Jeroboam in the north could have made the decision to trust God and to continue to allow the people to go to Jerusalem and to worship. And sure, many of them may have, have, uh, their loyalty may have changed. In fact, many people actually moved south out of the northern tribes and went to Judah to go and live there because they were, they continued to worship Yahweh. Uh, He could have trusted God and done that. Jeroboam, uh, Rehoboam, excuse me, the king of Judah, actually did trust God. When God told him through the prophet, don't, uh, don't take this army that you've put together and go to war with your brothers, um, your fellow Israelites. So Rehoboam, at least at some level, was trusting God. And, and in fact, we read Second Chronicles. Actually, you should read that on your own. Second Chronicles 12. It does say that... Uh, when Shishak came up and was, was uh, destroying the cities, and that they repented. They said, we've done wrong, God, before you. They, they uh, humbled themselves. They repented before God. And because God was using Shishak as judgment against them for their idolatrousness. And it says, it tells us in Second Chronicles, they repented and God relented. Um, he... he helped Shishak make this decision to accept the gold and to leave, and allowed, it says, he allowed them, being the, the, um, the people in Judah who had repented, to live, and allowed Rehoboam to continue to live. So even though he made a lot of really poor decisions and was not trusting God and had set up this idolatrous, these idolatrous things that were happening in the high places and the male prostitutes and all of that, he began trusting God And he also, um, at least at one other point, probably about five years down the road, was trusting God when he repented. And uh, God honored that and at least let him continue to live. Um, The point there being that you're never too far away from God's hand to repent and, uh, and seek his forgiveness. Thinking back through some of this, Jeroboam, he let fear, his fear of losing the kingdom, his fear of not knowing what his future was, his fear of... Um, being on this path that he just, you know, he didn't know necessarily what the destination was or he didn't trust what the destination was. He let that fear turn into faithlessness, faithlessness. And that faithlessness turns into disloyalty, disloyalty against God in particular, and then disloyalty finally turning into idolatry. Um, Again, 
keep in mind that the failure both of the north and the south is the fruit of Solomon and his reign and the things that he allowed to happen, the, in fact, the idolatry that he brought in. Um, and yet, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, um, even they perpetuated the sins of Solomon. So they're still culpable. They're still responsible. They're still accountable for the things that they did. Consider how much this affected the entire kingdom. Now, you may not be a king. In fact, I don't know, I know most of you, and I know there aren't any kings or queens here that I'm aware of, at least. But you do have a sphere of influence. Uh, so just as a gentle reminder that the decisions that you make, the trust that you put in God and how you display that to other people affects those around you. Just like Jeroboam's decisions affected the whole nation, really. Um, your nation, your family, your sphere of influence is affected by the decisions that you make and by your faithfulness toward God, your continued trust in Him. Which brings me to a question. Are you, especially in our day and age right now, are you living in a state of fear like Jeroboam was? Um, you know, there's a lot to be concerned about in our lives right now. And it's always easier to trust God when things are smooth, at least we like to think it is. Most of the time we just ignore Him when things are going well. And when things are going bad, we cry out, which is kind of what Rehoboam did. Um, and he's okay with that to a certain extent. I mean, he definitely wants us to cry out to Him when we need Him. He also wants us to be thankful and loving Him when we're not right in the middle of a crisis. Um, So right now in our state, in our towns, uh, we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are faced with life-changing decisions. Um, decisions regarding, I don't, this, listen to this all the way through, okay, because I'm not being political here, um, but decisions to make regarding mandates that are coming, or at least that are on the horizon regarding uh, the vaccine. And these decisions are going to affect people's jobs. I've been in, in speaking with multiple people who are concerned about how do I address this? How do I make a good conscious decision this direction or a good conscious decision this direction? Um, and, and what are the consequences going to be in either, in either of these decisions? Because both decisions really do have consequences of one sort or another. Um, so now you're going to ask me, should we or shouldn't we? Shouldn't we, right? Yeah, well, I don't know. Uh, it actually reminds me, this whole situation in one sense reminds me of Joshua um, when he was up by Jericho and he lifts up his eyes, uh, that's Joshua 5.13, and he looks and behold, a man was standing before him with his sword drawn in his hand and Joshua went to him and he said, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And he says, no, but I am the angel of the Lord's armies. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to, to the earth, and he worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And Joshua did so. Now this ends the chapter. It ends with Joshua having this confrontation and ending at this, this place of worship. The chapter starts out with God telling Joshua to go back and, and uh, circumcise for a second time the people. Now you can't be circumcised more than once, okay? I don't know if you understand this, but you, can't, you can only be circumcised once. But there were a lot of people in the camp that had not been circumcised. So God is telling him, go back to the people. And, and in, a, in multiple ways here, it's like you're going to remind them of the covenant we have. You're also going to remind them of their trust in me. Because when you circumcise, in particularly adults, they're not very fit to fight at, for a period of time, okay? Okay. Um, and they're in the middle of, of entering into the land. They're about to go to Jericho and, you know, do the whole circling thing, and, and uh, the walls are going to fall down. So God is calling them back into this covenant relationship. He's also reminding them where their trust needs to lie, that their trust needs to lie in Him. Uh, so that's how this chapter starts, started, Joshua 5. And then it ends with, um, instead of some this encounter and, and the... The command of the Lord's army just saying, no, I'm not for you or for your adversaries, but I am the Lord. And Joshua does, he has the right response here, actually. He worships and he trusts. Um, and that's the headspace we need to be in as well. Listen carefully here, okay? God is much more concerned with your faithfulness than he is with whether you get a vaccine or you don't get a vaccine, okay? 
He's more concerned about your faithfulness and your character than whether you're vaccinated or not. Now, this part's going to be a little bit harder for us to hear because we're Americans and we like our freedoms. And I get that. I like my freedom. We live in a relatively free society, a free culture, a free country for the most part. And yet we all come under somebody's authority. Um, just start denying listening to anybody. And, and sooner or later, I had to tell my, my uh, foster child this at one point, at some point in time, you're gonna, you, somebody's going to arrest you because you're not listening to any authority, okay? And I'm, I'm not trying to compare this to the vaccine at the moment, all right? A little bit different context here, but... Um, at some point, you're going to be under somebody's authority. We all are under someone's authority. Let it be God's initially and primarily. Because um, God is also more concerned with your faithfulness than he is with your freedom. So in our narrative tonight, God was more concerned with the faithfulness of his people than with whether they retained their land, which he had given them, or their wealth, which got taken back to Egypt. Uh, and both failed primarily, uh, the two kings, that is. And then I, I uh, said, but well, we would look at Second Chronicles, so I encourage you to look at that because you actually see where um, uh, Jer Rehoboam in the south actually trusted God and repented. So he repented and the Lord relented, although he still let them experience discipline. They lost everything, all the gold treasure out of the temple, and um, they lost their freedom because God let them experience servitude to Egypt at this point uh, and allowed them to contrast it. If you look at, well, if, you, if we had looked at, at uh, this passages in Chronicles, in contrast, it says, um, nevertheless, they shall be servants to him that they may know my service and the services of the kingdoms of the country. So he's contrasting this being in service to God or being uh, in service to Egypt. All right. Um, so trust. Trust in the path God has you on. We would all have the same map if we all went over to the lava beds together, okay? Um, but we are not talking about a map of the lava beds. We don't all have the same map. We do all have the same destination, though, or destinations. Those of us trusting in God are going to end up with Him in glory in heaven. Those who aren't are going to end up eternally separated from Him, which I mean, we talk about that. It's hell, right? Um, what is hell? Well, hell is, is eternal separation from everything that's good. It's the separation from life because Jesus Christ is the source of everything that's good, and he is the source of life. So this is eternal separation from the source of life. To bring it back to the vaccine for just a moment, um, I want to tell you, you're free to get vaccinated, okay, and to trust God. You're also free to make a conscientious decision to not get vaccinated and to trust in God. Um, some of our brothers and sisters in Christ are very likely in the upcoming days to lose their jobs because of decisions that they're going to make. Good, solid, conscientious decisions, okay? Maybe not the same decision that you would make. Maybe not the same decision that I would make if we were in their shoes. But as Christians, God is much more concerned about our relationship with one another about our unity, <laughs> sorry, about our unity together, the unity that he gives us through the Holy Spirit, he grants us unity and the ability to be unified under Christ, in Christ. He's much more concerned about that than he is the other thing. So brothers and sisters, be prepared to be able to have civil conversations with people that may be on the other side of this issue than you, um, to be able to hear their side, be accepting of it, and also to help those who are, there's going to be people that are going to be in need um, because of some decisions that they're going to need to make. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, that unity, again, is more important to God than anything about all the rest of this pandemic. Uh, so we need to be prepared to help each other in those places. Um, none of this is liable to be easy. No one ever said trusting was easy. No one ever said remaining unified while disagreeing would be easy. Loving one another is not always easy. Even when we're at our best, it's not always easy to love. And yet God, and yet God, he commands us in these areas, but he also empowers us through his spirit. And by using all things for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purposes as he molds and shape us, shapes us into the likeness of his son. 
We can't do that on our own. We need him and we need his spirit to help us. So let's ask him for exactly that. Father, we want to, uh, well, first of all, just thank you for your word tonight, Lord. And um, I pray that my brothers and sisters here heard your voice and heard you. The things that I may have said that are not of you, Lord, I pray that you just help them filter those things out. And uh, most of all, Lord, that we would trust you, that we would um, be more concerned about our faithfulness in you and our brothers and sisters in, in you about their faithfulness in you too. Not about decisions we might make, Lord, uh, but about our trust in you. And we're able to trust you in a variety of ways. We're able to love one another in a variety of ways. Uh, so Father, help us as a culture, as a society, but in particularly as the body of Christ to remain unified and to continue to love one another and help one another in difficult times, Lord. We need your help to do this, so please pour out your spirit upon us. Help us to do this well and to be a good witness in our culture and in our society because your word says that they will know you by your love for one another. Father, help us to do that well, that the world will see, that the world will come to know who you are. We love you, Lord, and thank you again for your word, for the sacrifice of your son, for your goodness, your faithfulness, for your trustworthiness in Jesus' name. Amen.